There are many theories as to why the Viking Age started. Some say there was a population boom in Norway, and Denmark in particular. Others say that the growth of the Frankish Empire allowed the establishment of large-scale trade routes, and so an increase in piracy. Others have explained the Viking Age as a religious conflict. Monasteries were often targeted, after all. A few decades before the attack on Lindisfarne, the Christians under Charlemagne burned down Irminsul, a sacred tree to the Germanic pagans. Whatever the reasons, the period could not have been possible without the longship. Propelled by oar and sail, it was fast, sturdy and flexible. Of course, I've already discussed the longship's construction in a previous video, and what it was like being aboard one. In this video we'll be discussing an aspect as important as the construction, and that is how the Vikings were able to navigate the Baltic coasts, the rivers of Russia, and the frigid waters of the North Atlantic. Since the Mesolithic era, some peoples have navigated the open sea based on knowledge of streams, winds, fish species, and other observable things. Most prominent were the Polynesians. The Scandinavians, however, did not seem to have any tradition of long-distance voyages on the open sea before the end of the 8th century. That doesn't mean that the boat wasn't important to the Scandinavian way of life. Indeed, boats were part of most Scandinavians' everyday lives well into the 19th century. It was very much a maritime society. In the 11th century, Adam of Bremen wrote that But the journey itself is like that. If you sail from Scania of the Danes, you will reach Birka or Sigtuna first on the fifth day. But if you make this journey on land from Scania, through the lands of the Goths, the journey to Sigtuna will take a whole month. Viking society was entirely shaped by waterway travel. Settlements were established along the water routes, and their modern names indicates these origins. These names depended on what was done at the route in the area. Places with watchfires had names with Vard, Vitul, Kas, and so on. Places with portages were named Nur, Edor, Drag. Travel by water had a lot of advantages. It was hard and hazardous to travel by wagon due to the horrible quality of the roads. Horses were fast, but there were a lot of hazards along the route that prevented fast travel, such as stones, roots, and low-hanging tree branches that could just bitch-slap you as you rode past. Horses couldn't carry a lot of package, and they needed food, water, and rest. A boat, however, could carry more cargo and not worry about these issues. It was essentially a fast and reliable wagon. You might think that stones and rapids would prove an issue. An experiment was done in 2000, where it was possible to sail from one of Sweden's Baltic Gulfs, uh, the Lake Mälaren, to the inland lake of Värmland. The experiment was conducted in a boat built with Iron Age techniques. Despite the boat traveling in very shallow streams, often a meter or less deep, it was able to glide smoothly. When the boat struck rocks in the rapids, the special planks of the period didn't crack, but bent and slid over. The keel was protected by a false keel. In case of obstacles, the crew were able to transport a boat over a 5 km portage. Portage is the act of transporting a vessel overland from one body of water to another. This could be done by just carrying the boat. That could be done by one person for smaller vessels. For larger crafts, you could roll it over wheels or over greased logs. Oxen were sometimes used for pulling the ships. In the later centuries, these methods would continue where roads were not improved. Most prominently in northern Sweden, where land passages between waterways have been preserved into the 20th century, thanks to their usefulness for the forest industry. Viking and medieval kings would frequently bring their ships with them on land. In 1227, King Haakon of Norway had his troops carry a fleet of 35 ships from Oslo to the river of Glumma. In the 1170s, the Norwegian king Sverri allegedly carried his ships to a mountain passage 676 meters above the sea level. Waterway travel was vital to every facet of Iron Age Scandinavian life. Watchfires, blockades and fortifications were established along the waterways to protect against pirates and invasion fleets, though I intend to discuss this more in another video. When armies and boats became heavier in the 13th and 14th centuries, the waterways were only used for peaceful communication. That was, and always has been, trade and travel. Waterways were vital for the mining industry well into the industrial age. In the early 20th century, people in northern and central Sweden still traveled to church by water. In some areas they pulled their boats between waterways, in other areas they had a boat in each lake and exchanged them. An alternative to horses and boats were the winter roads. 
when the roads were filled by snow and the waterways froze over, it was possible to travel rapidly over them using skates, skis and sledges. But again, uh, that's for another video. So why did people stop traveling by boats? Change happened procedurally. In the Middle Ages, travel with horses became more important. The boat lost its symbolic value to the horse and the knight. Wayrests and taverns were established along the roads to accommodate for horseback travel. When your horse got tired, you could simply exchange it for another. In the 17th century, roads were improved to accommodate for wagons. In the Iron and Middle Ages, wagons had not been used for travel in Scandinavia. The roads were just too bumpy and unreliable. The 18th and 19th centuries saw an expansion in farming, and population growth demanded more arable farmland. Thus, it became necessary to drain waterways. Some lakes in Sweden were much larger before the industrial era, while other lakes have ceased to exist entirely. It should be mentioned that the sea level in Sweden was like, I think like 4 to 8 meters higher than it is today. Rivers became dikes or dried up entirely. Suddenly it was much harder to travel by water, whilst it became easier to travel by land. Roads were improved and soon we'd see the railway and the motor car. Serious navigational methods had not been necessary for travel along rivers, lakes and coasts. Navigation in the Baltic Sea was hardly a problem, since most of the routes followed land. The oldest sailing route known to be documented dates to the 13th century, and belonged to the Danish king Valdemar. Whilst we'd imagined the route as a map, uh, maps weren't used for navigation until the late Middle Ages. Instead, the route appears as an appendix in his book of land possessions, and it lists a number of places from Blekinge to Danish conquered Estonia. The sailing route rounded Scania and continued up the Swedish east coast. Near modern Stockholm it crossed the sea to Finland, continued through the Finnish archipelago and coast, then finally crossed the Gulf of Finland to Estonia. In several places the route splits into several alternative routes. Inner routes were mainly possible to navigate with oars, and an outer route that allowed the use of a sail. It has been debated what the listed places actually represent. It could mean sheltered harbors, pilot stations or landmarks. Inland waterway and coastal navigation was primarily done by landmarks. These were both natural and constructed. Natural landmarks could be anything from a large tree to a rock formation, anything distinct, you name it. Constructed landmarks were primarily stone marks known as varde. In 870, Floki from Rogaland built a varde when he was waiting for wind to sail west. It was later called Floke Vardi and persists to this day. Stone crosses found along Scandinavian coasts might date back to the Viking Age and were used for this purpose. Vardes were often used as watchfires, and in Sweden they followed the Baltic sailing route. It is unknown when people began sailing across the Baltic directly, instead of following the coast. Some say that it was only possible with the introduction of the compass in the 13th century. Others say that sophisticated navigational methods were used before that, and that they allowed sailing day and night, and thus directly across the sea. The origins of these navigational methods may come as a surprise, and that is what we'll discuss next. Starting in the 9th century, Vikings began undertaking major voyages not just along coasts and rivers, but across the ocean. They colonized the Faroe Isles, Iceland, Greenland, and even North America. This came from a people that had no history of open ocean navigation, leaving many historians speculating as to where the Viking navigation came from and how they navigated exactly. Many methods have been presented, like the observation of stars, the wind, streams, birds, the color of the sea, the temperature of the sea, smells, reflection of ice on clouds, and such. Whales only tend to seek food in certain places, and various birds only travel a certain distance from land. In movies we often see Vikings releasing captive birds. If these birds didn't return, land was close nearby. If they did return, it was far away. Though methods like these have been mentioned in the sagas, they were likely unreliable. Whilst the compass wasn't invented until the 13th century, alternative technologies have been presented as potentially being used in a similar manner. Corderite is a rather common hard mineral that is either transparent or semi-transparent. Seafarers allegedly used corderite as a compass since it changes color in different directions. The mineral is blue or violet in one direction and yellow or yellow-brown in another. A stone being used as a compass is mentioned in early medieval sources. It says that the sailors used ravens to show the way at sea because they had no life or stain in the north. 
According to one scholar, the stone used was magnetite. A more popular theory is the use of the hypothetical sunstone, called Solarstein. Though there isn't really any archaeological evidence of its existence, it has been interpreted as a kind of bearing plate to determine the position of the sun. The material would have been Icelandic spar, diorite or andalusite. The same principle is actually used in the modern navigation system for aeroplanes. Scholars have debated how the sunstone was used exactly. Some say it was used like a primitive compass. Others have said that a patch of blue sky was needed above the boat for the method to be useful in navigation. Therefore, its use was very limited. In several sagas, it is mentioned for measuring time, not navigation. Some sagas say that the sunstone wasn't used until Christian times, which was way after the Vikings started navigating the open seas. The story of Rödulf tells that The weather was cloudy and there was heavy snowfall. The king had observers watching, but nowhere was the sky without clouds. Then he asked Sigurd to tell how far the sun could have come, and Sigurd did that, and then the king had the sunstone taken up. And he saw how it shone from the stone, and he concluded then that it was, as Sigurd had said. The story indicates that the sunstone was merely an aid in cloudy weather. When held up vertically to the sky, it would catch the polarized light, from which it is possible to determine the height and the location of the sun. This knowledge was necessary to determine the position of the ship. Written records of the sun's azimuth and the meridian appear in the 12th century, but the techniques were probably known much earlier among sailors. The prevailing theory is that Vikings navigated the open sea by calculating their latitude. The sun was used to determine the position of the sun, and its height at midday was used to calculate latitude. The sun also marked the position of south. At night, latitude was calculated by measuring the angle between the horizon and the north star, which likewise marked the position of north. In Icelandic, the north star is called the Leifarskjarna, the star leading the way. These methods are reliable and have been documented since ancient Greece. With the fall of the Roman Empire, these texts were lost to the Western world. But not to the Arabs. They knew the concept of latitude and used it to navigate the Indian Ocean in the 9th and 10th centuries. Since the Vikings were the first Europeans to use astronomic navigations, historians believe this knowledge to have been transmitted from the Arab Caliphate. In Muslim Spain, the Vikings were known as Almadius, heathen wizards. Perhaps this was their name in the rest of the Arabic world. Judging by our archaeological findings from Scandinavia, it appears that the Vikings had trade contacts with the Arabic Caliphate as early as the 8th century. Arabic silver coins have been found in Viking markets of central Sweden. This contact in the 8th century coincided with major and sudden shipbuilding innovations, which the Vikings may have gotten from the Arabs, some at least. Most important was the sail, which never appeared in Scandinavian craft before. Of course, the sail was used in the entire Mediterranean, uh, much, much more before the Arabs. But many important seafaring words stem from Arabic, like Admiral, Missen and Asimov. Another piece of evidence is a 12th century Icelandic text called the Rimtol. The first text contains an astronomical vocabulary with names in Greek and Arabic, showing that the names were used by the Icelander seafaring population, while still uncommon in continental Europe. The text describes stars, planets, and the height of the sun at midday, but it isn't a nautical table. Rimtol 2 provides the midday heights of the sun on North Iceland for the whole year. This hints at the Icelanders having access to an instrument for measuring angles, an astrolabium. This was used on land and sea to measure the height of the sun, stars and astral bodies. This astrolabium is even illustrated in Rimtol 2. The illustration bears a strong resemblance to older navigational equipment from Turkey, and the astrolabiums used by the Arabs of the 9th century, when they navigated the Indian Ocean. It would appear that astronomical navigation was transmitted to the Vikings through contact with the Arab world. Sun navigation was developed as a less reliable complement to navigation at night. This allowed them to undertake long voyages overseas. However, a lot of their findings were done by accident. During cloudy weather, or a thick and lasting fog, the sailors could get lost at sea. This was actually how the Vikings discovered Iceland and some other places. When Haddad and Gunbjörn wanted to go to Iceland, uh, they got stuck in a fog and instead they discovered a new place, which they named Gunnbjörnskär. When Erik the Red was banned from Norway for <laughs> killing a few too many, he decided to improve on the findings of the two sailors. He systematically investigated the coast of Gunnbjörnskär, naming every fjord and traveling a distance of a thousand kilometers. 
he decided to give Gunnbjörn Skan a new name, Greenland. This was basically a marketing trick. He wanted the name to sound more appealing, so that more people would attempt it to come and settle down there with him. A fleet of 25 ships departed Norway, but only 14 arrived. Later expeditions were more successfully navigated. In the richest colony on Greenland, there were at least 190 farms. So how long did a Viking voyage take across the North Sea? A passage from Scandinavia to the British Isles could take three days. Traveling from Norway to Iceland, uh, 7 to 20. And from Iceland to Ireland, 3 days. Huge thanks to Bradley Rodder, my first supporter on Patreon. If you want to support the channel, please check out the links to PayPal and Patreon in the video description. Otherwise, boost the algorithm by giving the video a like and a comment, and sharing it with a friend. Cheers.